Okay. Um, minutes from the September meeting. Corrections, uh, errata, anything of that nature. Witchy? Um, just uh, three things. Um, the first one being in the attendance list, number one is just a blank. I don't know if that was intentional, just naming that. Right. Um, on the page number four, it says maybe talk about this next month after reviewing the 2019 report. Rebecca said that. Um, I just needed to, I just, is that 2019 report on the SharePoint? It should be on the RDAP page of the AGO's website. That's where it's lived for a long time now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, and that was all of my questions. Thanks. Okay. Grant, you have those? Yeah. Okay, great. So, is there a motion to do something? I can make a motion to accept the minutes with the amendments that Witchy offered. Great. Is there a second? Sheila. Okay, great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Got it. Thank you. All opposed? All abstentions? Minutes are approved with Witchy's amendments. Jen? Oh, you were just, okay, never yeah, mind. Just noting that I'm standing aside because I had the plague right. last month. Got it. Got it. Remember, glad you're over the plague. Thank yeah. you. Um, that, was me, that was me too, and uh, Aton, because I was not at the last meeting. Got so it. Much. That's right. You weren't either. Thank you. So two abstentions. Still the mo it's carried. Uh, wanted to begin with a discussion of the recently completed audit of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council and the Vermont Police Academy with reference, as the agenda says, to potential duties of the RDAP that may come out of this, and there may also be none. That's why it's potential. To that end, um, I invited Heather Simons, who is the executive director of the council, to come and speak with us about the audit, perhaps give us a bit of history of how it came about, um, reactions to it, where directions that the council is now planning to go in, given the results of the audit. And then we can talk a little bit perhaps about what we need to do, if anything, at this point in time. Heather, I will turn this over to you. And welcome. Thank you, Eitan. And uh, thank you everyone for uh, giving us this time. And when I say us, um, I mean uh, Jen Furpo, who is my colleague down the hall and the many council members who are also on that I know will um, pick up what I'm missing in terms of a healthy overview. And just one other thing is um, we have a class going on. We have a few classes going on, so it might get a little loud and it won't, It just for a second though, everybody's moving along and I can mute if it gets too distracting, but mostly I'll just plow right through. So let me, I, I want to say uh, when I talked to Aton a few days ago, where we landed was, uh, yes, let's start that discussion uh, tonight. Um, I think the the nature of the report, it's comprehensive, it gets very specific, and it focuses um, only on Rule 13 and in-service training, but nonetheless, if I had, ha you know, if I had a few weeks, I would probably be drilling down with a pretty hearty slide deck for you and walk you through uh, a lot more. I think what's appropriate for tonight is to give you an overview of the work, a little bit about how it started, 
what we have going on here, um, what our plan is. Uh oh. It's um, it's haunted. It's it's haunted. The academy is haunted. So that happens a lot. Or it's just you know the way it is. Um, so a summary I think is the most appropriate, and I really am open to, you know to questions as we move along, and I'll ask Jen to kind of help me facilitate that. Um, Aton, I know that you're very good at it, but I did listen to your last meeting and I heard you put your foot down on having to multitask in 10 different ways. So I think, um, I, you know, I, I appreciate that. But if you really, really, if you want to stop me and ask a question, you can. And there are there's a lot in this audit that I um, have to go back and refer to. So that's also an, um, an offer from us to you that if there's more that you want to hear, if there's more detail that you want us to get into, we can we can come back and do our homework in the meantime. So I'll just jump right in. So the state auditor's office contacted me last summer and I'll, I started uh, April of 21, but I really don't really remember the first six months. It was kind of a blur. So it was uh, one of maybe 50 things that were priority last summer in terms of trying to coordinate how we would just jump into responding to an audit that we were very open to. I think one, uh, you know, anyone who knows anything about the council and the academy will know that it's sort of notoriously underfunded, that um, it has been operating a little bit like an island and uh, coming from an organization where folks can get lost in the training world, you kind of have to have all those um, connections to decision makers in order to get resource. So I want you to have a visual of what the work looks like here. A lot of times people get the council confused with the operations of the police academy and how the academy is staffed. And then um, in addition to that, um, a lot of people think that the only thing that we do for training here is is the basic training, and that's uh, that's a heavy lift anyway. But it's not the only thing that that we do. And given that it's um, independent or not under another state agency, we don't have a business office, we don't have an IT department, we don't have a policy unit. And uh, there are, I think there are a couple of legislators last year that referred to it as mom and pop. And though I don't really love that description because it's very professional and we're moving through a lot of changes, it's kind of accurate in terms of how um, the staff have had to move through transition and leadership, um, unfunded mandates, um, you know, asking for technology and resources to get us into the really the 21st century in terms of uh, alternative pathways to training, et cetera. That wasn't easy. And so um, for a number of reasons, including some of the challenges I just described, this audit was, uh, we welcomed it. And anyone who's been through an audit knows that it's an enormous amount of work for the people, you know, for staff, it's a lot of legwork and producing documents. And uh, we were already, you know, this was already a concern for me and it was shared uh, by the directors that there were, we were missing a lot of internal policies and that there were um, procedures and guidelines that had been put in place and the absence of formal policy over years. And, and, and it's not unusual in this kind of culture that things become rule without actually being written down. And that was another reason for us to um, dial it back and really figure out with the help of the auditors, what in fact is it that we are required to do and who required it? When was it required? And, and in some cases we couldn't, we couldn't find anything. There was, um, uh, there was some sorting out of the direction that they were going to take in the beginning, though they made it clear that their focus was on Rule 13, which is our in-service requirements for law enforcement, 
we still, it still took us a few months to not um, sort of fight the, the urge to want to explain content of training or, um, or instructional strategies or access to training. And they had to, they reminded all of us, including the agencies that they worked with, that this was really the most basic assessment. What were we mandated to do? And um, how did we record it? And that also, we, as you, any of you who've read the full audit will see that recording training is really a, a challenge. This wasn't shocking to me. It can be complicated. Um, I certainly worked through these kinds of issues in, in other training positions. And it comes down to um, what we bump up against when we mandate training by time, we're not measuring skill and proficiency. And I'm sure I sound like a broken record to many of you because you've heard me say this so many times and I'll probably keep saying it, but that is what, you know, that is one thing that was flushed out through this process is when, when, um, when law enforcement attends, uh, uh, attends a training, either in person or remotely or online, that the hours were being tracked and they were uh, attested to and sent into the police academy from the agency head who really um, submitted an annual affidavit that their folks were attending this number of trainings and for this many hours. And so some of the themes that came out of this. One is how do we measure hours? For example, if uh, Aton has a training online and um, I get on and finish it in five minutes, but it's an hour training, am I attending five minutes of training or am I attending an hour of training? And if we, um, if we advertise a training that's 2.5 hours, uh, but we have very few participants and we move through the content quickly and it's over in an hour and a half. Is it two and a half hours or is it an hour and a half? And these uh, these are all this is not just us. This is this is any high liability training Stop where you. you start looking into how you um, measure um, training hours, not just in what we call podium time, but also um, it becomes an issue with things like overtime and travel. So if you go to a training from eight to four and uh, you take lunch for an hour, do you count the lunch hour if you're if you have submitted 12 hours of training from your agency because it's two hours to drive there? Is that your training day? because it might be the day that you paid for to be a training or is it attending training? So uh, it's not unusual for us to have to sort this kind of thing out. We've done it before. Um, it was uh, certainly a concern for me. And, um, and in the bigger picture outside the audit, this is the training model that I'm encouraging all of us to, to look at which is training to proficiency and training to competency. And that means that from the policy level down, we have to be very clear what we want staff to be able to do when they finish training. And that, um, I would say that probably of all the staff time that went into this audit, that was um, the one topic that we discussed the most that we knew that we were going to have to provide more guidance on. And, um, and here's the other thing about, here's the other thing about the council. We would go to address one issue and then find a whole, a whole host of other problems that need to be solved. So it's not as easy as just changing the requirement for numbers of hours, but then we needed to, you know, we needed to look into, let's say it was um, something like um, use of force training, for example, where you would have scenarios associated with it. The challenge is, are your, you know, how do you measure scenario hours and uh, what topic do you put them in? 
That's a general theme with regards to in-service training. The rest of the audit had to do with um, tracking and and our response to to that really was um, again, we we knew this was a challenge. And one of the things that the auditors had advised us of is this <laughs> human error is a large part of uh, why we need to really move to uh, software and training tracking systems that you can't that you can input what you're doing and that it keeps it forever. But there are still some systems, including us, that are sending out paper certificates. And um, even entering time into our own system, it's tedious work and mistakes happen. And those mistakes can happen on the other end, including from the agencies. And I know, I, I know that that was also, um, I believe they chose 12 agencies and they found some issues in a few of them. Um, my overall sense of the, of the mistakes that were made were, was that they were just that, that they were m mistakes. Um, they weren't issues of integrity. I do think though, um, moving forward that we, while we tighten this up, we need to be very clear what we mean when we, when we say training. And that that's a value statement that sometimes gets applied not just not just with the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, but I think everywhere. So um, awareness training is not training. That is a meeting or a discussion. And for purposes of transferring information and skills with it, we need to be very careful when we send folks to cert to events that have topics attached to them. That we un, that we are mandating that something comes out of it, and awareness training in a high liability arena is extremely hard to measure, and that happens a lot. The uh, you know so, and some trainings are not trainings; they're meetings. They're they're just meetings, and and meetings are okay. The traditional thinking around this, I mean, it goes back to I'm dating myself, but. When I first started attending training well over 20 years ago, there, there was no online training. There was no Google. There was no remote learning. And so training was a place you go. And there weren't that many topics. And so self-directed learning didn't really exist in that environment because access to training was really difficult to have. Now there are, um, you know, a dozen more choices that people can that can choose, and uh, that causes some issues in terms of consistency, um, relevance, and uh, and tracking as well. Then there are other areas that influence the auditors in terms of guidelines that we have to put out. One exa uh, one other example is. If you are an instructor in a specific topic, can you also count it as attending training? And I think to some extent you can, but again, that's an area where you can't, we couldn't, we couldn't just immediately put out a guideline one way or another. We needed to really look at the whole problem. So if I am, if I am an instructor in de-escalation and I um, do 40 hours of ins instructing, for the academy, does that count as 40 hours for my in-service training? It's relevant. There's nothing in our internal policy or rule that says that you can't do that. But I think best practice would say that you would want your employee to branch out of their, you know, what they already know how to do, what they've attended as a participant, and what they've shown that they are a subject matter expert in already and they would have fulfilled their 30 hours of in-service training twice. So guidance becomes more complicated. Do we, um, I think in the training world, they kind of call it double dipping. What we also have to look at is what is X, you know, what is an acceptable number of hours if you are going to do that? And again, how do you measure it? Are there any questions about that so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. I never asked you, Aton, how much time 
I had um, some. Well, yeah, give it give it another, you know, 10 minutes or so. OK, so. Oh, um, Sheila's got a question. Sorry. It's OK, no, no, Sheila. No worries. I have more. It might be more of a comment that might kind of stem into a question. Oh, I, I mean, it is a question slash comment. It was really funny. Right when you said that you were um, uh, moving away from the time, I guess, to talk about proficiency and competency, I think are the words that you used. And I had I had wrote down, um, why is it more uh, about the time versus the understanding of proficiency? So I thought it was interesting that you mentioned that, but I'm kind of curious around this hours um from i want to make sure i'm understanding correctly what i hear is is that um some training is based on hours and that app if you have you have to have so many hours of such and such training and it's not about testing out it's not about proficiency it's not about competency it's not about even necessarily fully being able to demonstrate whatever it is that you learned or got taught but it's more about that you showed up and you spent X amount of time on it, and you might get a paper certificate in the mail for that. Is that sort of what I just heard in a summary? Yes, and, and for purposes of this audit, we're t they were looking at what we're mandated to do. So for example, it is in statute that the um, domestic violence training every other year is 2.5 hours, and it doesn't, um, it doesn't necessarily um, dictate what the content is, uh, just the time. And I can tell I got that wrong because Jen's got her hand up. Jen? Jen. Yes, yeah, sorry. The, the statute actually does not assign a specific hour uh, length of time to the annual the, the biennial domestic violence training. It simply says that the training is um, the domestic violence training update as approved by the Criminal Justice Council. And that's a really great example of why we don't want to, um, that why we want to train to the concept and not to the hour number. How did we get two and a half, 2.5 hours then? I have no idea where 2.5 hours came from other Is than um, the last training in, um, well, the training we have going right now is two hours long. Um, is it FIP? Is FIP 2.5? Uh, no, FIP was two hours. Okay, enough out of you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> so, so you are saying that it's really just about the hours. And I'm just wondering who again came up with that concept? And I'm assuming like the department has adopted that and is trying to now more critically look at that is what I'm hearing. Yeah, well, it's cert I mean, it's certainly, it, it's not best practices in training. Um, that we know. Um, th the There are trainings that are mandated in terms of numbers of hours, because we discussed it all last session, I know, with FIP. So I will go back and do, you know, do that homework in terms of exactly where it came from. And I appreciate Jen speaking up, because I think I've said, 2.5 hours in a few different public meetings, so it's good to get that corrected. But the um, uh, the there was a, a lot of discussion about you know what like what has been happening here all along. What is what is required in our rules, and what is in statute. And um, it's certainly not a concept that. It's one I, I understand and I've heard a lot for many years and it happens to be, it's kind of a go-to. When something goes wrong, leadership tends to say, you know what, we need 40 hours. Of, we need like we need to fix that problem with, with numbers of hours or days or a week of training. And um, for folks that have um, run academies before, there's usually, there's this sort of general sentiment that when when anybody has a good idea, the place to put it is in the academy and just sort of squeeze it in amongst everything else and call it a training and give it a couple hours and it's just not that easy. In this arena, um, any high liability training, uh, corrections, law enforcement, takes about 30 hours to develop one hour of training, and that's in-person training. 
that doesn't include um, additional hours to form measurable scenarios and online training is even more complex because it really ought to be around uh, what we're building to be defendable and what's skill-based. So if that's what you meant by concept, then yes. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you being candid and honest in this discussion. Yeah, my pleasure. The rest, um, the rest of, so how this all links together is um, uh, all of the work that we have to do with regards to our internal policies and what we're going to require. And the we is uh, the council. Um, there is a fair amount of work to do within the rules committee, and they have been meeting for some time. And Evan Meaning is the chair and did an enormous amount of work. And even with all of those updates, uh, we'll have to go back post audit and take a look at um, the rules that impact what the requirements might be for this in service training. And the in-service rule 13 training focuses um, also on firearms and first aid and CPR, and domestic violence and uh, fair and impartial policing, um, use of force. Uh, they also looked at um, the uh, model policies for body worn camera, um, the CEW and the legislative requirements around tasers and I think that's I think that's it and I will tell you that I you know I I could have looked and looked and looked and not found on my own and I don't I don't know if the rest of the staff here would agree we you know this this our responsibility to supervise the compliance of agencies around the their consistency and posting uh, policies, I'm not sure that we knew that that was us. We knew that we held the responsibility mm. to make sure everyone posted them, but I don't believe we would have gotten there on our own. And that the, the auditors um, are very clear that in how they interpret, um, how they interpret the law and the mandate is that we need to be supervising the consistency with these policies. And there was a fairly meaty report out from them with Joint Justice Oversight, I think last week, it might have been the week before, I, I lose track of time, but recent enough. And uh, they addressed that as well. Uh, they also, um, they were also pretty clear that the, my, my response to the audit was, yes, we agree. We have a lot of work to do. We knew that. It's important for me to say that out loud, though I know it can be semantics, but um, in a time where we're asking folks to do more and um, to, to be vulnerable and to trust and to go with change, it can be, it can be really demoralizing when uh, folks go through an audit process and auditors come back with, with big news that the very people who have been working on this have said all along. And I want to be clear that um, a good majority of the, of the staff at the academy had been asking for assistance. They had been um, collecting information about uh, challenges and inconsistencies consistencies and things that didn't work. And, and that, um, that goes a long way in, ter in terms of fixing these issues, because if there isn't buy-in, then there isn't progress, and there is, and this is a heavy lift. And the reality around this work is, um, what, you know, one, we have a lot of hope, and I don't want to under underestimate how important that is. We have an enormous amount of support, and I don't count, um, you know, I don't count getting frustrated or complaining as not having support. I mean, we're, we're all coming from different places, and we're all having to figure out what has to happen. And this has been, um, we're not fully staffed. 
We haven't been since I got here. There's been some very predictable attrition. And uh, when you think about the roughly uh, 1,300 sworn officers that we serve, and that's about, that's two training coordinators for level three basic training and level two, and two supporting training coordinators for programs, and a director of training that's fully staffed, we'd be at 13. Um, that's, and that's a basic training academy, two levels, two additional levels of certification, 15 committees and subcommittees, 24 members of the council, several legislative mandates, and like I said, um, no IT, no policy unit, no business office, and nobody's complaining about that. But it, it, we, it, we just want you to know that um, this is big and the attention on this audit and the work that RDAP is doing and the work across the state is, uh, we welcome it because we would like more eyes on the direction that we're going in and the sentiment that we have to go along with it. I'm gonna leave it there, Eitan, since your hand's yeah. up and I didn't see it, sorry about that. Nope, that's okay. I am curious, we are mandated to be in a kind of support position to the council. Is there, are there, things that the you all, the council, need from the RDAP at this point that you can name? Or is this something that, frankly, the council needs to work on first, and then that's a question that might be asked at a later date? Well, I, I, I did, you know, I, I did listen to your last meeting, and I, I do understand the concern around, um, you know, is does the council need some more time to organize in their mission to make an appropriate request? Um, is this the right time for RDAP to get involved? Should you be steering it, or sh should we? I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I will tell you this, if anyone who wants to help, yes, please. Um, we are in need of resources and we're asking for them. Um, we identified some other areas that I think you know, deserve some airtime, for example, all of the fair and impartial policing work that's happening across the state, all of the training that I know that you're doing, um, there is not one full-time fair and impartial policing trainer for law enforcement in this state. There are a couple folks that are doing training in addition to their jobs, but there's an awful lot that the council's being asked to do, that we're being asked to do, and there is not a position in the whole state, not just not here, but in the whole state. And uh, again, that, you know, there's, there are responsibilities that we have with regards to traffic stop data, um, uh, a full curriculum assessment. There is a pretty considerable ask that we're gonna make with regards to certification and accreditation. That's gonna take about three years and we wanna do it more quickly than that. So I think, let me just put the question back to you and say, what do you feel like doing? Because we need all, everything. And we're, we're, we're pretty ready to, um, to, to give some direction there. I would guess the best answer I could give you on that at this moment is that the person who was working on that in the subcommittee because we broke it into subcommittees at the moment. Um, and that subcommittee that was focusing on the academy and the council was made up of Evan and myself. I'm assuming it may well be Tim now, who has just come on board, and this is his first day. 
So, Tim, I don't know, but I have a feeling you and I need to sit down and have a conversation about this. Um, and I, I think we may need a little bit of time in order to gather ourselves together because as you probably heard last week, we were still waiting to hear last month. I mean, we were still waiting to hear back really what the council needed from us. So you're throwing it back to us catches us a little bit by surprise. Me throwing it back to you. Yes, you're saying I'm going to throw it back to you and say, what do you want to do? Well, I, I think let me I, I don't that sounds sort of rude when you put it like that. Like I didn't. Mean no, to no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I don't yeah, mean to I be rude. I think, no, no, no. Not you. Me. Me. I think I think um, if I understand that for our DAP, it is to, you know, it is to give direction to the council. Is that right? With Rick? Yes. With the training. Okay. So, um, I'll say that, you know, if, if we, if we were going to move in the direction of what I just laid out in terms of being competency based and focused on proficiency, then, then maybe a place to start is, a discussion around what is it that you would like, uh, what does RDEP want to see as a result of training? Great, we can do that. Thank you, that was easy. It wasn't for me, I'm sorry it took me. <laughs> no, 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 that was fine, that was really clear, that was great, thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Are there other questions from people? Anything from anybody? Do you understand, uh, Chief? Yeah, I just had a question. If RDAP is going to work on what you would like to see as for outcomes or training, I guess what, who would determine what happens if those are not met? Um, is that more from RDAP recommendations or would that be like, well, we didn't meet it, but they had the training and let's move on. The reason why I'm saying is because when to follow up with what um, Sheila was saying was that two hours, that's the length of a movie. I mean, it's not really that much time when there's a lot of data uh, against profiling and other things that are happening within the state. It just doesn't seem like it's that ample of a time. Maybe maybe I'm off a little bit, but um, but I, I just was wondering that if there's outcome and outcome measures what happens if they're not met, I guess. And what does that mean to the individual officer or the program? Because I know they have a set amount of time to go through the academy, right? I mean, it's not like it's a, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, like you have a leeway, um, you know, cause I mean, classes probably start and then they end. But um, so I, I was just curious, maybe that's too deep right now, but I just didn't know what, how that how that would work that's all i'm asking or how what that looks like I, and i i think you're asking me right yeah okay um well i you know first of all the what has to happen on the job really needs to be determined by agencies and the practitioners um, in the training world, it's really about how to implement the change that we want to see. And, um, and training really guides along, you know, how to, how to operationalize the change in policy, the shift in mission, or, the, or the shift in practices. And there's any there, you know, there's a broad direction that we could go in or there are specific topics. And when I say broad direction, I mean things like um, if we you know, we are moving and we are moving towards a trauma informed academy. And that means that we would be delivering content and scenarios that would be measurably informed 
that um, that we would have a full review of our all of our lesson plans. That it, this um, that this practice would be embedded into our instructor development, and that would also be measurable. That that would be to me um, a broader project, or there or we can narrow it down and look at one uh, one module or um, one set of activities like just scenarios and um, building up scenarios that are uh, that we have a system for in Vermont that we know are one relevant to the job that two are trauma informed that are um, inclusive that cover all the bases in terms of being defendable training um, that's a big that's a big project, but it's not huge. It's a little smaller, or you can take it right down to one actual topic, which is, uh, I think, what the Fair and Impartial Policing Committee under the Council is working on is how to direct uh, training content and training content for for the academy. And so, for purposes of this explanation, when I say academy, I mean the level three basic training. I'm not. I'm not even getting into in-service training mandates or the level two, which is what people consider part-time officers or any or any of the um, hundreds of hours of other topics. Okay. Mark. Hey, Todd. What's up, fam? Hello. How y'all doing? It's a night. <laughs> yeah, thanks for taking this up. I appreciate the follow up and the follow through is, and uh, it's cool to see some familiar faces and some not so familiar. Um, and uh, Heather, I appreciate your um, candor and just how um, straightforward you're taking this. It's um, pretty refreshing, you know, just to get it from you straight, and I think I think my concern is is the fact that um, what we're dealing with is is we're we're dealing with some challenges that are clearly systemic, um, and even if you clean this up to the best of your ability, and I hope you stick around for another ten years or so, but after you're gone, who's to say it won't fall apart again? Um, and I don't mean to be pessimistic, but I'm trying to make a point here. Mm -hmm. uh, is is that clearly there are some there are some um, systemic breakdowns that have occurred uh, within uh, the council, and um, I just don't want the gravity to be lost on anybody. You know, I don't. I'm not subject to Stockholm syndrome because I'm not here very much. But I would just say that um, you know we're talking about 1,300 officers and. 79 agencies, and we're talking about 628,000 folks across the state, and we're talking about their safety. Uh, we're, we're talking about Title 20, 2358 and 2360, uh, I believe it is, on uh, fair and impartial policing policy and race data collection and training. And this, this is the reason why this group was established. Uh, when when we went in and created this group in 2017, the primary reason was is because we were concerned about compliance to Title 20, 2358, and 2368, I think it is, or something like that, 2358, 2360. That's the reason why the RDAP was created. And you were created as an oversight committee. They just didn't give us that. So that's why they called you advisory. How do we know we wrote the bill? <clears throat> so I think... Um, so that's what's problematic from this community, former RDAP vice chair's perspective. Um, and as I was reading through the minority report, for those of you who've been around, you probably know what that is. Um, I did see that there was some very little um, attention that was given to this matter per se, but I just don't want it to be lost on you that um, this is um, this is real, and th this this is not. And Heather, this is not one of those things. It's like get her, you know. Where's the pitchfork? It's not that conversation, but clearly there's some guidance 
and some oversight that's just not there that, you know, not to beat the consul over the head, but at least give the consul some guidance on what these statutes actually mean and what their statutory responsibilities are to make sure we don't have breakdowns like this uh, in the future. And that we don't have to rely on individuals to be able to ensure that compliance is, um, is sustainable. Uh, and what that means is, is that that means consistent uh, oversight um, mm -hmm. to provide that um, that hand, if you will. And, and I think that I don't think it's fair to, to Heather, actually, to ask Heather, oh, what do you want us to do? No, I don't think it's fair to Heather. I don't think it's fair to you at all. I, I think mm -hmm. that this is a, a, a joint um, joint justice oversight slash RDAP conversation. And and I think that the I think that the there should be prescribed to the to the uh, consul um, very very clear um, very clear uh, guidance on exactly what the expectations are in in terms of providing clarity to Title Twenty as it pertains to them. Mm -hmm. um, that's the least we could do for them for the for the consul. I mean, before we start talking about giving them the resources that they need to get the job done, um, I think the only other thing that I see in this is, is that there seems to be, and I talked to TJ about this, Aaron, before he left, is, is, is that there's this relationship that the attorney general has here, um, the attorney general's office has with the alleged uh, oversight or some type of, you know, there's there's this thing that the attorney general has in a role in, you know, in policing and when they step in across the state, if they feel a need to do so, I know that there's a provision where they've been required, been um, called upon to say, for example, review the fair and impartial policing policy before the console, blah, blah, blah. But there's always this, the attorney general's a part of it, but then they're outside of it at the same time. Um, and I think that that's ambiguous too. And I don't think that really helps y'all at all uh, because theoretically you would think that the attorney general would have a role here. His office, the, uh, your office rather, excuse me, um, would have a role in some type of oversight apparatus as it pertains to the, um, the consul, but the <laughs> attorney general's on the consul. Um, so I think that that should probably be uh, considered maybe you know, respectfully, maybe the attorney general shouldn't be on the consul uh, for for that reasons and maybe more. Um, maybe work in collabor co collaboration with the consul. Whatever the final solution is, I hope that um, the RDAP steps back and gives this some careful consideration. I would kindly ask you, request that you give it some additional careful consideration and maybe not try to work to a resolution tonight. Step back, think about uh, what's hanging in the balance here and the gravity that this has on our communities across the, the state. Because when we have folks that could potentially be missing in service, and we're specifically talking about in service training when we when we created this this uh, panel, this the RDAP uh, or policy or or data collection. When we're talking about all these things and these requirements, we put them down for a reason. Uh, and that's and that's uh, you know that thing that we call public safety, and we're talking about consistency. So hopefully you know, somebody can have some conversations with somebody in House uh, Government Operations, um, House uh, Senate Government Operations, because I know House Government Operations Rule 25 is oversight. Um, I I know that um, Sarah Copeland Hanses and Jeanette White haven't been a you know they didn't do a very good job of that in the past, but they're gone. Um, but I'm hoping that we have some oversight conversations. We certainly will be coming back this legislative session uh, having a similar conversation. Thanks for the time. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Witchy, why don't we finish this particular conversation up with you so we can move on to the rest of the agenda? Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Witchy. Sorry, can you hear me now? 
Yep. Uh, I, was, I was talking to the to the ether a little bit. Um. So. <laughs> Uh, just first want to show my appreciation, Mark. Thank you. You know, I'm a recent new member to RDAP, so it's a, uh, it's nice to sort of be be brought back to uh, the original mission and and sort of contextualize these these um, our existence, uh, and definitely had on my notes uh, sort of like thinking about like oh what I heard a lot is uh, is about resources, not just about you know policy changes, but also like you know with all these with changes it always comes like okay how do we get it done then, um which I think Mark was was partially talking about. And something else that I also had on my notes that Mark was also referencing, but just want to come at it from a different angle here, um, is the concept of the amount of responsibilities uh, under our police forces currently. One of the things that we consistently hear from all sides, right, uh, is that the police are burdened with too much responsibility, whether it be mental health or solving homelessness or, you know, yada, yada, it's all under the police force. So as we think about giving resources for training, I think it's important for us to also consider what are what are we giving mon uh, resources to training for and how much of it are we actually also concentrating on making sure that there are resources to being able to um, uh, uh, diversify uh, the ways that we approach public safety, because uh, this is sort of, to Mark's point, the greater uh, system that we're talking about. We're not just talking about a little bit of aspect here. So, um, and also appreciating, Heather, really appreciating you coming in here to, to talk to us about the report. Sometimes I look at large documents and I'm like, oh, is this what I'm supposed to read? Holy moly. Um, so just uh, um, really appreciating you breaking it down and, and sharing your, your perspective um, and um, yeah, so just just wanted to put in those notes, uh, definitely trying to lift Mark's message up a little bit with a little bit of my own perspective on it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Eitan, can I just respond quickly and sure. like get to your meeting sure. um, to, to Michi and to Mark? And uh, I, you know, I appreciate all that you pointed out and and I should have brought this up earlier. The audit is the business of making sure that we're headed in the direction that we want to be in in Vermont. It's it's the business end of it. I didn't talk about the um, the agencies that go above and beyond mandates for training um, and professionalism, and I didn't get to you know I didn't get to the to to the stuff that um, I would love for all of you to come and see in terms of where we're headed with uh, scenarios and how you can see this skill-based training going in another direction. I, I want to say this. We have one police academy in this state, and that is an incredible opportunity. Uh, Ohio has something like, I, don't, I think, like 50. We have one for all law enforcement agencies, the opportunity for us to standardize in a way that we message um, not just skills, but mission and sentiment and safety and community and inclusion, um, it's right in front of us. And that can happen here. And it's not just, it's not going to be the executive director saying we can't do anything unless we have five positions. I was fortunately raised in a department that does not ever find that funny that you know we have to we have got to innovate and we have got to find ways to um, inspire people that are tired to remind them that we can do more than we think that we can do and to remember that while we're figuring out what the legal ramifications are and how much things cost that someone is waiting for us right now someone vulnerable, someone young, someone who's waited too long, and someone who needs to see change. And those folks don't really care about data and policy. And they want they want to feel better and they want to be safer. And I think that this is the place where we can um, we can show how to do that and that everything can be trained that when we talk about de-escalation training, that's a broad term. We can break that down. What is the quality of the interaction with everybody? How are we 
how are we measuring our language when we when we bring interpreters into a situation are we also interpreting body language and culture and pain these are that's what i mean when i say proficiency and skill i don't mean take a, a you know a 50 answer multiple multiple question exam. I mean, real life scenarios that um, people from the community can see, you know, if that if, th if that was handled that way, it would have gone, it would have gone much better, or we would have been better off. So um, the meat of the, you know, the audit gives me anxiety because it's an audit, but, um, but I think the possibility it uh, gives me a lot of optimism, and I really appreciate your time tonight. I'm sorry I went on for so long, but you you inspired me. So thank you. Great. All right. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. And um, just so everyone knows, um, Tim and I are already starting to talk about when we're going to meet. So um if there are other people it had only been evan and i on the subcommittee that was do that was planning on doing this work if there are others who have been inspired by what heather is talking about um feel free to join us um there's nothing planned yet in terms of scheduling but i, I, just, I want just want to put the in excuse me I just wanted to put the invitation out there. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Heather. The next item that we need to uh, look at is feedback from the panel on the draft language access proposal that was sent out after the last meeting. You will recall that um, Executive Director Davis asked for feedback on this. Um, I sent it to you right after the meeting, along with um, a presentation by Jennifer Pullman or, well, and others, I'm assuming, um, communi communication justice in Vermont. Um, and so I am opening the floor up, what, for feedback. That is correct, correct, Susanna? Correct. Okay, feedback. This was part of your homework. We need the Jeopardy theme music for moments like this. So. <laughs> I just want to say thank you Witchy. to um, the committee for taking this up. Um, it's something that Susanna and Senator Rahm were really helpful with thinking about. And um, our hope was just to shine a light and a spotlight on some of the pieces that really need um, to be bolstered and really interesting findings that we had. So I, I didn't do the amazing work that our intern did, but I think she really flagged that Vermont's a little bit different than other states and that we don't have that secondary language that's so dominant. And how do we um, how do we think about how we do this moving forward? So I will I will be quiet, but thank you for thinking about this piece and thinking about language access. And it's something that um, we are really passionate about. Thank you. Witchy? I'm just going to be an honest person right now and definitely missed that it got buried in my email and was did not have a um, time to, to review it. So just know that I will be reviewing it on on my own and will probably send uh, comments to uh, Susanna uh, apart unless we talk about it again next, next agenda and then I can prepare by then. Well, we may do that. Yeah. So hold, I'm sorry. My bad. I was just going to say that I can also resend the uh, online form. I think it's a three question form uh, where you can also provide feedback on it if you would rather provide that in writing. But um, I am available for anyone's comments. All uh, constructive critique is welcome. Why don't we send that out too? I think doing all of it is probably a good idea. Sheila? 
Um, I had a thanks, Aton, and thanks, Susanna, for doing this. Um, I um, had a couple of um, sort of feedback comments on the document. Um, one of the things that I was kind of curious about was um, when it said in uh, section four, consider an interpretation. Um, I was I was just wondering about the thought of how being bilingual and being to being able to interpret are two very different things. And I I see that kind of being starting to be recognized in this document, but not really fully. And I feel like it might be conflated or assumed that if you're bilingual, then that can transfer into interpretation skills. And when you really are doing professional interpretation, it depends on what you mean. There's different types and different levels of interpretation. So I'm just sort of curious about um, that. I have a question around that. And if you all have thought about that, and if you have, is there uh, understanding how to tease out what we mean by interpretation? Because sometimes it's perfectly acceptable, but on a legal level and on a professional level, and on different types of levels, it sometimes doesn't transfer. So that was one of the comments and uh, questions that I kind of had. And I don't know if you want me to, um, I think I'll just do one at a time, or do you want me to say the other ones that I had? In which document are you referencing? The one that looks like a chart that has the 26 ish recommendations that's correct and it's in section four all the yeah. way yeah that, yep. that's where i pick it up i think it's referenced a few other places it could be applicable as well but um I, again yeah. i'm just concerned about that yeah thank you for that the short answer is yes that is um a big part of the thinking for us is to make sure that it's clear in the final document that um being bilingual and being suited to interpret are not the same thing and you'll find that at a few different points in um, in this summary document, for example, there are a couple of items in there that recommend um, standards for uh, quality standards, so that you don't have people who just walk around saying, "Oh yeah, I did," you know, "I lived in France for six weeks. I can translate things," um, but that you actually have a, a system that allows for people to. Um, have proper education in this field and that also gives recourse to people who use interpretation services if there's a problem with the quality or service from an interpreter or a translator. So it is important to us to make that distinction. You can't just call up a local delivery you know, place and say, hey, send me someone who speaks this language. So the short answer is yes, we are aware and that will be part of the final document. That's great. Um, my next comment is in section five in the um, third column bulleted. I just, it says, paraphrasing my multilingual liaisons and encourage their adequate compensation and training. I would just get rid of encourage. Like, I think they need and should have an adequate compensation and training. So I would, I would like to void out and encourage and actually give people um, a decent wage. And that's part of my other question too. I know that in this document refer references per diems and some other things in there, but I'm also very concerned for that as well. Um, and wondering how that will be teased out within this document, because often um, people who are multilingual will be what I'm going to ca be calling tokenized or used for their gifts, their skill, their 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 uh, being of life, and really never compensated for that. So I'm really curious because I see again this document sort of referencing that, but then I'm wondering how that will tease out um, in the final sort of completion of this. Yep. So to that point, I, I can speak as a person who has been routinely utilized as a translator in different jobs that I've held. Um, what this document is saying is that if you're going to expect state staff to be translating or interpreting, that that should be factored into their job expectations and they should be paid accordingly. That that's true on the front end during the recruitment phase and also afterward if you're modifying a person's duties. So that's what those references are to things like per diems, flat fees or other forms of compensation to ensure that state staff who are expected to translate or interpret are being compensated fairly. To the point you made earlier about um, multilingual liaisons and encouraging their fair pay, the reason it says encourage is because this is a document that rec makes recommendations to state government because the state government does not hire the multilingual liaisons that work in the school district. And because of the advent of local control in Vermont, we are limited in what we can force the school districts to do when it comes to who they're paying and for how much. So what we can do is encourage very strongly 
the school districts to follow adequate pay protocols. Another thing that may not necessarily, I don't even remember if it's in this document or not, but something that we've submitted to the governor's office for our policy priorities includes a school level needs assessment for multilingual liaisons so that we can properly get a sense of what the need is around the state and make sure that this profession has adequate support and education. This is also something that the Racial Equity Task Force put out as one of its many recommendations a couple of years ago is deploying that school level needs assessment. We are estimating it will take between one hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars to conduct, but we are still gathering um, some information related to that. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, I, I just have a couple of more questions. I don't know, Aton, if you want me to ask them or not. If that's no, I think you should. I'm I'm not sure that we have others, so I think um, please go ahead. You know, as quickly as you can. Yes. So um, section 11 all the way over. I'm just so excuse me for my ignorance, but um, it says, how can we ensure state employees can respond promptly? Who exactly are responding to these type of complaints? It really depends. There's a lot of um, there's a very broad swath of people who receive complaints that might be, for example, hey, I was visiting your state parks and I had a complaint about the adequacy of the bathroom in the state park. And they might be complaining on the, fish, um, the parks and Oh my gosh, what is it? The um, Forest and Park um, Department. Or they might be putting in a formal complaint with, I don't know, um, Department of Public Safety saying my civil rights were violated. Or it could be a complaint with the tax department saying one of your compliance agents called me up on the phone and uh, was disrespectful or whatever it is. So there's a lot of people, AGO's office, I mean, everyone, there's a lot of places that take complaints. And so they each have different mechanisms for how they route those complaints, who's responding, when they respond, through what um, through what communications means, right? So, so, for example, one department might have, have a form that you fill out that says, hey, call me back, this is my phone number, et cetera. Another one, it might be that they only communicate by email, and so you may be only you know, back and forth once a day. So the short answer is everyone is taking these complaints, and that's one of the reasons that if we're creating a unified uh, standardized language access policy, trying to create uniformity in the way that we receive complaints in various languages, spoken and non-spoken. It means we also have to know how to, um, I don't know, digest those inputs so that then we can reach back out to the person in a way that is timely. So if someone sends us a video upload of them using ASL signing their complaint to us, we have to first get the notification that we got a complaint in have somebody sit and look at it, recognize, hey, this is someone who's signing an ASL, get someone who presumably is on contract with the state to view that video. And again, depending on the department they're talking about, this could be sensitive information. We don't know. So we have like disclosure and privacy issues. So all of that kind of needs to be figured out. And that's what that bullet point, that's more of an internal note to us, but that's what that bullet point is really referencing. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and the last thing I want to say, um, ask is around um, section 24. And I mean, I guess it's a little more comment slash question around protocol may be different for state appointed interpreters versus complaints made against independent interpreters. And I understand the logic behind that. My question is not wanting to create a us them. Um, you know, state as though I respect all those of you who work for the state, kudos to you, thank you. Um, those of us who don't work for the state, <laughs> kudos to us too. And so I'm wondering how that will be, if there's discussion around how that'll be laid out so there isn't us, yam, us them, or will the people who are not, um, who are independent be more aligned with the state expectations because if you're calling on them through state a lot of times there is i guess certain maybe regulations or requirements that the state might have i'm just i'm just a little bit curious and confused about what the discussion around that might be yeah so the reason that that's in there it's not because we're creating an us them it's because there necessarily exists one because if the state is hiring people to translate or interpret then they're on contract with us, so they're accountable to us. So if they mess up, then we have recourse for dealing with it. But if somebody comes for services and they have their own interpreter, I'm not gonna force a person to say, you have to use my interpreter that we're providing by the state, right? It's like, if you have an indigent defendant who has a state appointed attorney, that's one thing. If you have a defendant who has a private attorney, that's another. And so for me to be able to have recourse to deal with the person, um, a person's complaint, like if we provide an interpreter, the state, 
and there's a problem with that person's service, um, then we have recourse for how to deal with it. But if it's someone who's not hired by the state, then we may be limited in what we can do to address the problem. That may be their organization or their employer who has to deal with it because it, you know, it may be a private right of action. I don't know. So um, the reason that that's in there is because the protocols that we can follow for um, addressing any positive or negative things related to state-funded interpretation services is going to have to be different than the protocols for someone who's not employed by us and therefore less accountable to us. So this is in there not so that we're creating an us then, but just to account for the fact that we're not going to be every interpreter's boss. Um, thank you so much for answering my questions. That's all that I have. I want to say that I really like this document and I like the way that it's laid out. For me, having to read a lot of stuff, and it, it helps to, I like the layout. It's clear. It's a lot more simplified for me and I was able to get through it and understand. So thank you for um, answering my questions and good work on this particular document. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you for giving it a close read as well. Appreciate that very much. Well, Elizabeth. Thanks, Eitan. So I have, um, I don't have necessarily an answer to this, but I'm wondering if this was considered at all, because uh, I don't see it in the document. Um, so if it's there, just let me know and, and <laughs> highlight what number it is. But specifically within DCF, we see um, kids translating for their parents. Um, and there have been a few situations, and I'm happy to connect back with the staff member who is specifically engaged with this instance, but um, youth uh, translating for their parents um, during hearings. Um, and I'm concerned about if there have been any conversations about that and how potentially we could approach that in a better way. Uh, we had concerns about the youth potentially understanding what was going on appropriately to translate for their parents um, and obviously had serious concerns about that and voiced that to the court system. Um, so just just highlighting that is something that we've seen as a problem. Yeah, thanks for saying that. That I think relates back to Sheila's first question about not everyone who's bilingual is necessarily suited to be an interpreter. And one of the more recent cases that DCF had about that, I, I was grateful to be pulled into that. And we had conversations between DCF and the courts who were running the um, that, that particular case uh, in question. This is something that's gonna be, um, this is part of the reason that we are creating a unified language access. Well, I mean, we've been talking about this for three years, we're just getting around to it, but um, this is going to be one. This is one of the big um, pieces of that is just making sure that if people are bringing interpreters, it's because there is an appropriate pool of professionals who can do this work who have sector-specific knowledge, right? The specialized um, terminology and specialized interactions that happen in justice situations versus healthcare, clinical situations, um, et cetera. For example, education interpreting is an entirely different animal. People think of it as just one big thing, but it, that's a very nuanced space. So yes, we've definitely considered it. We know that some people end up bringing family members, including children, uh, to mm -hmm. interpret out of, a, out of a need or a sense of uh, desperation because they don't have other options and we don't want to see more of that. We also don't want to be paternalistic and tell people who is and is not allowed to be their interpreter as well. So we're really walking a line between not disempowering people by disallowing trusted members of their community to interpret, but also making sure that people don't make those choices because they think that they have to. So um, for us, the ideal outcome is being able to provide people options that are vetted and trustworthy and um, making sure that we have the resources in place to provide the service if they need us to provide it or if they want us to provide it. Um, you know, this is, we're creating a more perfect world, but we're not creating a perfect world. And so I know that there are gonna be situations where this probably ends up happening again. And in those circumstances, I also wanna be able to see the system have built in mechanisms to address that, right? Oh, hey, you know what, this hearing, started and finished and we had a child interpreting and a decision was made and we don't know if the respondent mm -hmm. was fully aware of her rights. You know, I know that this is difficult for people in the court system to imagine, but I would love to basically see the equivalent of a do-over in circumstances like that, right? Um, so I think that there are bigger systemic things that happen 
outside of the creation of a language access plan that also need to be in place so that if language access fails, there is recourse, not just within the language access protocols, but also outside of them. Okay. Rebecca? Thanks, Eitan. Uh, Susanna, I've shared some of, of, of my comments already on this chart previously. I just wanted to build upon a couple that haven't been touched upon here tonight. And it's it's focused on seven, no, eight, nine, which is technology and resources. And they're recognizing that in the US people of color are more likely to rely on mobile phones or tablets to access the internet. And then nine, of course, talks about the three branches of government using different platforms to access remotely, right? The legislature using Zoom, executive using Teams, judiciary using WebEx. And then the recommendation there um, is to try to build uniformity as I, I see the recommendation. My comment here is um, the, that I'd like to see focus on uniformity of access itself, sort of building upon the themes that Sheila built, uh, talked about it othering. What, what I see happening in the judiciary, uh, let's assume there is a uniform platform used across the branches, uh, that others and, and the non-government um, you know, litigants are only able to access by way of phone. So putting them at a distinct disadvantage and, and, and not having equal access fundamentally. And um, so hey, I'd like to see sort of that interplay between eight and nine sort of addressed head on in terms of cons building consistency and where that's not possible, how to develop policies and protocols to set up the record to make it clear, to try to adjust accordingly. Um, second, or also, related to all these concerns about competency and practice, best practices, not best practices, using children as interpreters. Um, what, what we're still seeing is a failure in the, in the judiciary specifically, a failure to record uh, these court proceedings of the actual court interpretation so that there is no way to check later on whether or not the interpretation was actually meeting the standards, was actually providing accurate um, interpretation. So I, I don't know if I missed that, is Susanna, but sort of this emphasis on ensuring that there again the checks and balances, but just the basic one of having a record um, policies of of have, making sure that happens. Thanks. Yeah, Great. thank you for that. I, I wasn't aware of those lapses in recording for interpretation. Do you mean where the interpreter is a box in the Zoom or is physically in in person? Uh, where where there is simultaneous interpretation going on um, in court proceedings, it is not a standardized policy in the judiciary to record those court interpreting uh, ter interpretations. So it's 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 arguably lost, right? It's it's going on, um, and so it, while we're having it in the moment, there's no way to check whether they're, they're accurate or not, unless, you know, consecutive interpretation is getting captured um, in the record, but where it's happening at the same time, and, and there are a lot of advantages to simultaneous interpretation, uh, the flow is, is smoother, right? And, and that's a great development, but what we're seeing in the judiciary is not the corresponding necessity of recording that separately. Mm, okay. Yeah, that seems to me like something that we can absolutely figure out, and um, I would be very interested just to learn more about what you're saying so that we can make sure that we find a way to address it. The other thing that you mentioned was the differences in platforms. And what I'll say is that if we do end up, um, well, I'll say this, if we were to go with a one platform across all state government, the one we would recommend is probably Zoom Gov. Um, that is distinct from Zoom. And it appears to be the one that has the greatest uh, accessibility um, features. So that's probably the one that we would recommend. Um, but, you know, I also don't know that anybody would take that recommendation. So the alternative that we've put in there, you'll see is, you know, less desirable, but it basically says, if you're not going to do one platform, then at the very least, 
make sure that everybody knows how to use all three of the ones we're using. And I'm saying three, but it's really three with an asterisk because you know, we also have, for example, um, I'm aware of committees that go to meetings, right? We have, believe it or not, some people still meeting on Google Meet. So it really is quite an array. And, um, you know, in the absence of a unified platform, the very least I think we can do is make sure that people can access the various ones we're making them use. But I'm also very concerned about what you said about um, the, the potential due process issues around not being able to see the proceedings and only being uh, on by phone, particularly in a state that has such broadband issues. I mean, you know, even if you knew how to use the platform, who's to say you can connect? Judge Morrissey. Yeah, I was just going to add on what Rebecca just said in terms of capturing, making sure to capture um, what is being translated. Uh, this comes up almost every time when you're talking about people who are using sign language interpreters, that there are no, there's not really a running video being made in most courthouses of um, of that conversation that's taking place between the, the, the litigant and the interpreter. So when you, there's a hearing involved with people who are using sign language, it creates an, an additional layer that needs to be addressed. Um, and I recall a hearing that I had a termination of parental rights hearing where the uh, parent was deaf and we had hired video people to come in and videotape the proceeding so that we actually had a record of what was being uh, done in terms of the interpretation. So when you're talking about folks who are hearing impaired or deaf or using sign language interpreters, I think that's something that needs to be addressed as well. Okay. Elizabeth? Yeah, I just have one um, also quick addition, and I'm wondering about any other kinds of supports for um, translators as well. I'm particularly thinking about translators that, you know, our division might utilize um, and wanting to make sure that they don't feel like they are, um, you know, dropped in the middle uh, of something and then also wanting to make sure that they're paid appropriately for those supports, right? Like if they access, um, you know, support services within DCF um, to learn about a certain situation, then making sure that they're paid for that time. I'm not sure. I think I'm going on a little bit of a ramble here, mm -hmm. but essentially what I'm trying to um, express is that, um, you, you know, staff in our division, it, it can be very mentally difficult. Um, their day-to-day -day work is, is, is trying for them, and I would assume that that would be the same for many of the translators as well. Are you saying um, making sure that we're um, compensating people adequately for the continuing education that they're going to need to be able to do translation work? Yes, that and then also supporting them on if they need additional um, resources um, and mm -hmm. help as after they have conducted that work. And you're talking about state staff or any any interpreters we engage any with. interpreter right like especially if there's an interpreter but to your point where we have a state interpreter who ha is, has access to certain services but um there's a translator or interpreter who is being utilized from the community ensuring that they have um access to the same services that our state staff would have um, regarding mental health etc yeah, I uh, I would love to think from that a little bit more. We've been having this conversation with um, a number of community interpreters, a, a bit of a coalition that has formed on translating and interpreting. Um, and one of the questions that has come up is, is the state going to pay for people to get licenses? Is the state going to pay for uh, employee um, education? Is the state going to pay external entities, for profit interpreting companies, et cetera, um, to complete these requirements or for their licenses or whatever. And I think that there, there needs to be a real conversation about um, ownership of responsibility, right? Um, for example, I am routinely asked to give uh, counsel or training or consultation services to corporations in Vermont who really need to be paying somebody to do this work, but they just, they know that Susana always says yes to everyone and never charges anybody because, you know, public employee. Um, and so I think that we need to understand the line between what should the state be providing to external partners and what do those external partners need to step up and take on. 
So I think the answer is yes, with an asterisk. Um, I just want to make sure that like any other industry, we're providing the appropriate supports and the appropriate resources, but also allowing them to, you know, meet their obligations as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Aaron. And then let's move on. This is excellent, Susanna. I just had one. I'm not sure where to put it, but one addition might be to make sure that folks who are um, using interpretation or translation have an opportunity to um, object to any particular interpreter or translator, either because they can't understand that person or because maybe there's some concern about confidentiality or um, a, you know something to do with a relationship such that then they can't, they feel they can't be as forthcoming or that they're not, you know, that their voice isn't going to be heard in an accurate way. Could, you know, it's a small world. And when we're using community interpreters that sometimes people feel as though they don't have a choice in terms of who the interpreter is. And I would say that that would be an important um, choice that people should have. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for that. We have one in there that um, includes that kind of a provision for interpreters who may be worried about a conflict of interest or other uh, objection that they may have to interpreting. But um, it, it is important to make sure that that's highlighted for the person receiving those services as well. Thanks for that. Great. Thanks. Susanna, can I ask that you still send the um, comment sheet out? Yes. OK because that would be helpful, because I get a sense that uh, things are going to occur to people between now and the next meeting. Is there anyone yeah. else who has something? OK. Thanks, Susanna. <laughs> All right. We um, it's time for executive decisions because we have 11 minutes, so I'm going to apologize to Rebecca and the second look subcommittee and to the community safety reviews from uh, that which is sharing. Um, and you guys will be at the will be first in December. And I want to spend our last 10 minutes for well, first off, let me remind you, I wrote, I believe in an email, we're not going to meet on the 8th of November, no matter what the agenda says. It is election night. We're not doing it. Um, we will meet in December. Um, so I just want to point that out um, before launching into what I think we can perhaps do in the 10 minutes left to us. Um, I obviously put too much into this agenda, and I am sorry for that. But I would like to finish up with the discussion of the proffered definition of the term racial disparities. For those of you who do not recall, um, it was it was I, I believe it was in the minutes. Um, racial disparity is defined as existing in the criminal justice system when the proportion of a racial slash ethnic group within the control of the system is greater than the proportion of such groups in the general population. This is something that I was referred to by the Council of State Governments. Um, as I said, I would look that up for uh, get in touch with them about that. And this is where I was directed. This is an article from an article from 2000 entitled Reducing Racial Disparity in the Criminal Justice System, colon, a Manual for Practitioners and Policymakers, something we looked at in 2019 for that report. Uh, comments, feelings, is this something we can live with? Tim, oh no, Tim didn't really have a question. No, I'm sorry, I, I did. I'm, I don't know how to keep the hand raised. I have to work on that. <laughs> oh, OK, we'll go. Th go ahead then. Yeah. So um, I did discuss this with Evan briefly and I did look at the definition. And one thing that we, I think, think about on the prosecution side 
is disparities ac across the the spectrum of not just within the system, but also with. Uh, I think we were talking about Evan and I were having this discussion in contact with the system in multiple uh, capacities. And when I'm saying that, I'm talking mm -hmm. about a, a lack of. Um, or there are certain disparities. I'm sorry, my dog is being kind of loud in the back, but disparities with respect to victims, victims, advocates, attorneys, both prosecutors and defense attorneys, judges, police, and something that I used to discuss with State's Attorney Thibault um, when I worked in Washington County was also when you're thinking about the overall impact on the system with respect to disparity, who is calling the police? Um, Vermont uh, has mm -hmm. uh, certain. My dog is choosing to be so loud. Right now. When um, that's something that we talk You're about. Good. Thank you. It is who is calling the police because police, you know, they'll respond to a phone call um, or a report of an incident. Mm -hmm. And I think all of that, ideally, um, would be not uh, left out of a definition of disparity. And so. Okay. Um, summarized in instead of within the control to something along the lines of in contact with the system in any capacity. And that's just the first concept um, and more of an idea. Thank you for that. Thank you. Anyone else? So this is basically OK, then. Oops, sorry, I was talking. Um, uh, is this a definition that you already sent out or is this are we hearing this for the first time? No, I sent it out. Yes, thank you. All right. <laughs> Witchy after school. Elizabeth. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, I would just uh, to respond to Tim's comment, I would say, and I think I followed up with um, what the federal law, uh, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act defines as racial disparities, and they refer to that as a decision point, um, and they don't call those decision points specifically. They include points to, to what you were saying, Tim. They say that there's you know, obviously accesses into the system that aren't necessarily that are, you know, three or four steps beforehand. So that's that's the phrase that they use. Oh, that's um, if that's I, I helpful like, at all. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's great. OK, Monica. Yeah, I just wanted to offer that I um, appreciated um, Tim's sort of amendment and think that, that that's a, something that we should think about. OK, I'm sorry, I just realized my microphone wasn't down. So here I am now. Can you hear me better? <laughs> yes, absolutely. So that, um, well, I will send it out again. And um, when Grant finishes with the minutes, you all can will be able to read what's been said about this, what Tim has said about it. And then perhaps if you're interested, then work on refining it send it back to me and then I'll compile it and send it back out to the entire group. Don't worry about that. I'll get that together. In other words, we'll do this on email. Witchy. Um, I just want to clarify. I did read it and I gave comments ah. back. Um, <clears throat> and my comments were uh, just feeling like it was so that the definition was so I don't know, like not tangible that it, I didn't I didn't really feel it was helpful in like giving us answers on how do we like when we when were trying to like, especially I don't know, like thinking about second chance, for example, like if we were to consider uh, anyone who was affected by racial disparities, I'm like, what does that even mean in actual policy wise? Right. Like, does it mean like, OK, because I'm black, therefore I get a second chance. Right. Like, I don't like it just feels so. So uh, like, uh, I don't know, there, there's there's something missing that lets us grab on and, and dictate policies based on that. That's that's what I felt about it. But I look forward to reading Tim's comments on paper and not at eight o'clock at night when my brain is not working. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'll do what I said I was going to do and we'll we'll work it that way. 
Um, again, my oh, Sheila. Yeah, yeah, I concur with what with she said, and I just wanted to say I would like a just more layman sort of definition for us, and you know that can be the Webster or whatever kind of definition, but I would love for us to come up with what we're working for, what we're working with that, and make it much more relatable, much more experiential, as well as um, a means to be able to communicate effectively. The language just needs to shift. Okay. Rebecca. I wanted to uh, share that I agree with, with what Wuchi and Sheila just said. I'd go even more specific. I think we should be very clear from whose perspective we're talking about. Uh, for for okay. me, this is the not just all the litigants, right? This is not, this is about the person who is charged with an offense. This is about the juvenile, the kiddo who has been had a delinquency filed. So I want, I would like to have it clear that when we talk about racial disparities, we're talking first and foremost, those two. So just share that. We got more work to do on this one. Good to know. Thank you. All right. Um, anyone else on this? Okay, again, my apology for overstuffing the agenda, and um, I will take that under advisement for December. Please remember we're not meeting in November. Um, I will send things out um, by email for you. Um, mostly around the definition here. Um, and then of course, also some more uh, space for which, for, in which you may wish to comment on the language um, plan. Um, I think that's all I have to say, uh, except apologies once again for the technical issues. That just, you know, what are we gonna do? We thought we were gonna make it easier and Boy, that worked well. Um, that's on me, Aton. Wanna... My, my, I said, that's on me. That's my mea culpa. I, and no, also, I... we're just going to get this figured out in time for December. And then come January, we're going to have to figure out our in-person place because the remote-only meeting rule will expire. So, <laughs> My joy is infinite. <laughs> Um, so anyway, anyone want to move for us to go away now and maybe eat dinner? Chief needs his bowl of cereal. <laughs> I'll make that motion. Okay. Anyone want to second that? I'll, I'll second. second. All right. All in favor. Aye. 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 All opposed. <laughs> uh. All abstaining. <laughs> <laughs>